To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for the care of their land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I also like to take a moment to personally thank you all for attending today's presentation. Our speaker this afternoon is Chang Jing Jian, who will be presenting on detecting Lyme disease sooner, using proteomics to identify early biomarkers. Chang received his Bachelor of Science from Dalhousie University, double majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology and microbiology and immunology. He then completed his Master's of Science in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology under the supervision of Dr. Vanya Ewart, working on antifreeze proteins. Chang is currently working on Proteomix project to discover early biomarkers of Lyme disease and an assay development project to detect muscle atrophy, atrophy sorry, as a technician under the supervision of Dr. John Frampton. We are going to have Chang um, uh, carry out his presentation and then we will open up the questions from the audience. You can ask questions by entering your questions in the chat box, which we'll read off at the end or raising your hand icon. Uh, please help us welcome Chang to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to uh, start uh, sharing my screens now. All right. <clears throat> so uh, I am Chen. So today I'm going to talk about uh, one of my ongoing uh, project, uh, finding early biomarkers of uh, Lyme disease. I've been uh, investigating the potential biomarkers that can be used to detect the early Lyme disease using the patient serum samples. And uh, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about uh, Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is uh, transmitted by uh, tick bites and uh, the Borrelia bacteria can, are responsible for causing uh, Lyme disease. So the life cycle of uh, Borrelia is uh, complex and it involves two uh, primary hosts, uh, a vertebrate host and an invertebrate host. In the case of uh, Lyme disease, the primary uh, vertebrate host is typically a rodent. So uh, the bacteria are transmitted to the rodent through the bite of an uh, infected tick. So once inside the host, the bacteria can multiply and spread throughout the body. The bacteria may cause uh, symptoms uh, or become asymptomatic. So uh, <clears throat> the invertebrate host of, uh, of Borrelia is uh, typically a tick, which serves as a vector for the bacteria, meaning it can transmit bacteria from one host to another. During a feeding, the tick takes blood from the infected host, which contains the bacteria. Then uh, the bacteria can uh, multiply within the uh, tick's gut and uh, migrate into the saliva gland. So when the bacteria, so when the tick uh, feed on a new host, the bacteria can uh, transmit through the, uh, the tick's uh, saliva. So uh, during feeding, the tick introduces the saliva into the host uh, skin. So the tick saliva contains many proteins with specific uh, immunosuppressive uh, functions. The inhibition of a host innate immune response by a tick saliva could be beneficial for both uh, tick attachment and the Borrelia infection. For example, SALP15 is a protein that can bind to a Borrelia and facilitate their survival in the tick's gut. It can also inhibit the host immune response by interfering with the T cell activation, which helps the Borrelia to evade the immune detection, as well as the tick saliva gland protein and SALP20 found in the tick saliva, which facilitate the transmission of a Borrelia to the host by uh, binding to the bacteria and transporting the bacteria from the tick's gut into its uh, saliva gland, uh, where they can be injected into the host during feeding. There is also SALP25D that binds to a Borrelia and facilitate its survival in the tick gut. So uh, this protein can also inhibit the host immune response by blocking the activity of a complement which is a key uh, component for the innate immune re uh, reaction. There are, uh, those are just a few examples of uh, many proteins found in the tick saliva that are involved in facilitating the transmission of a Borrelia to the host. But there are many uh, other uh, tick saliva proteins with similar uh, immunosuppressive uh, functions. Uh, and the Borrelia itself also have uh, many mechanisms of evading the host immune response, which include hiding the uh, 
dense tissue uh, such as the tendons, down regulating surface antigen expression that are important for the tick part of their life cycle, but not for the human infection part. Inhibiting the host email, uh, innate immune response, including a complement cascade by capturing the complement regulators using their uh, surface proteins, as well as uh, changing the structure of their surface antigens by modifying their own genome, making the host immune system difficult to recognize and attack them. They also produce the biofil biofilm communities, which is a, a barrier that protects them from the host immune system and the antibiotics. So upon infection, Borrelia can uh, cause uh, Lyme disease and uh, lead to a range of uh, symptoms. Typically, the early symptom occurs within days to weeks after a tick bite. It may include a red expanding rash uh, at the site of the tick bite with a characteristic bullseye pattern, but not all the people with Lyme disease will develop this rash. And uh, in addition, there are other symptoms uh, that can include a uh, flu-like symptoms such as a fever, headache, uh, fatigue, and the uh, muscle and joint pain. If left untreated, the infection can uh, spread to the other part of the body, such as heart and nerve system and joints. So the symptoms may include uh, multiple rashes in a different part of the body, as well as uh, flu-like symptoms. And uh, other symptoms may include a stiff neck and a severe headache due to a, a meningitis and uh, facial paralysis or drooping on one side of the face due to a nerve uh, inflammation. It may also cause pain and swelling on the joint. Late stages occurs uh, weeks to months after the tick bite and it can cause long-term complications if left untreated. So uh, symptoms may include severe joint pain, swelling, partic uh, particularly in the knees and the muscle weakness, especially in uh, arms and legs. Other uh, symptoms may also include uh, cognitive and memory problems, fatigue and tiredness, vision changes such as uh, double vision or blurred vision, and uh, heart problems such as the irregular heartbeat or inflam inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, but not everybody with Lyme disease will experience those symptoms, and uh, some people may not develop symptoms until weeks or months after the initial tick bite. <clears throat> So uh, currently, the most common used method uh, to detect uh, Lyme disease is a blood test. There are two types of uh, blood tests typically used, uh, ELISA and Western blood. So ELISA is the first test to use uh, to detect uh, antibodies to Borrelia. If uh, ELISA is positive, a Western blood test is performed to uh, confirm the diagnosis. And the blood tests are the mostly uh, commonly used method for detecting a Borrelia infection and uh, can uh, detect the infection even if there are no symptoms, but it is only able to detect two to four weeks after the infection. The second method of detection is PCR, which is uh, typically used when there is a suspicion of uh, early Lyme disease. However, uh, PCR testing is not, widely, as not, is not as widely as used as a diagnostic tool for uh, Lyme disease. That is, as it is less sensitive and may produce uh, false negative results. Since uh, Borrelia bacteria can burrow themselves deep inside the tissue instead of being in the blood. However, uh, the sensitivity of PCR is also dependent on the type of sample being used. If a biopsy sample is used, the sensitivity can be enhanced. And the third method is a clinical diagnosis. So the diagnosis of uh, Lyme disease may be uh, based on the uh, presence of the rash which is a hallmark of the Lyme disease, and it is uh, typically uh, used uh, uh, to uh, uh, for, for, the, for the early diagnosis. If the patient has a history of uh, a tick bite and uh, the rash, and the patient will be uh, treated by the antibiotics to reduce the risk of uh, developing the uh, Lyme disease. <clears throat> So the objective of this uh, project is to find early biomarkers of a Borrelia infection and use the biomarkers to develop a way to detect uh, Lyme disease in the early phase. And why is this important? Because unlike most of the other bacteria or viral infections, Borrelia can burrow themselves deep inside the tissue instead of uh, replicating in the blood, which uh, makes their antigens difficult to detect. And currently, there is a hope in the early detection method for Lyme disease. The mostly, uh, most commonly used method is blood test, but it can only be used after the patient had, uh, have uh, developed the antibodies against Borrelia. 
So by the time severe symptoms could have already occurred. So that is why it is important to have an accurate method to detect early Borrelia infection. Um, in order to discover early Lyme disease biomarkers, it is necessary to figure out which biomarkers are up and down regulated. Um, in this case, using a proteomics. And this is a protocol I use to uh, study the biomarkers of uh, Lyme disease. The protocol starts with uh, 16 serum samples. Within these uh, 16 serum samples, 11 of them are from a Lyme disease patient, and four of them are healthy controls. Uh, uh, and one of them is uh, also a healthy control, but it is used as the normalizer uh, to compare the result between uh, different data sets. The serum samples will be uh, passing will be passed through the columns uh, called the top 14 abundant protein depletion columns to remove those proteins that are highly abundant in the serum to reduce the background. Uh, and those proteins are listed here on the side. So going through this process essentially denoids the background generated by those proteins uh, in the final results. The proteins in the flow through were collected, then uh, subjected to a uh, methanol chloroform protein precipitation. Using this protocol, I was able to isolate the proteins at the interface, and those proteins can later be uh, precipitated and uh, collected. The proteins were collected and uh, vacuum dried, and the dried protein samples were dissolved uh, in 8 molar urea and the trypsin are added to the protein solution to digest the proteins uh, in order to cleave, them, to cleave them into a smaller peptide with a size of uh, 700 to 1500 uh, Daltons. So later on, it will be possible to use mass spec to read their uh, amino acid sequences. The peptide were labeled by a TMT 16 plex labeling reagents. So all the peptide from each particular patient are going to be labeled by one of the 16 labeling reagents. Therefore, uh, when all the samples are combined, it is going to be possible to tell which uh, peptide corresponding to which labeling or patient in the final results. The labeled peptide were combined into one combined sample, then, subject, uh, then subjected to a liquid chromatography to separate their uh, to separate the combined sample into 60 fractions in order to reduce the sample complexity. It uh, essentially looks like this, as the peptide in the combined samples are separated into 60 fractions, it generates a spectrum like this, with the different fractions or time as the x-axis and the amount of the peptide as the y-axis. So uh, each fraction contains a portion of the combined sample and the purpose of this is to reduce the sample complexity because instead of feeding all the samples at once to the mass spec, loading the fractions one by one to the mass spec reduces the burden for the mass spec to read the samples. <clears throat> so the fractions were uh, subjected to orbital trap fusion lumos, which is a mass spec that uh, coupled with uh, another liquid chromatography. I need to specify this is another round of a liquid chromatography coupled with a mass spec. So once the samples are loaded, the machine automatically injects each fraction into the liquid chromatography to further, uh, to further reduce the sample complexity of each fraction, which are then automatically loaded uh, into the mass spec. And the peptide are ionized and then fragmented uh, to a smaller peptide fragment, which can be used to determine their amino acid sequences. The resulting peptide sequence are then uh, searched against the protein sequencing database uh, to identify the proteins that match the peptide sequence. The software I used to piece together the peptide into uh, proteins uh, is uh, Proteome uh, Discoverer. So after the data analysis, it provides this kind of data, which lists the name of each protein found from uh, each patient as well as their individual uh, protein uh, abundance. So for each patient, it is going to display the abundance of all the proteins from the serum sample of that patient. It can also calculate the average Lyme to healthy abundance ratio for each protein, as well as the p-value. <clears throat> 
So uh, using this kind of data, I can calculate the fold change and the significance of each protein and create a volcano plot with fold change as the x-axis and uh, the significance of the y-axis. So I'm currently using the cutoff line with the fold change above 1.5 and uh, the significance above 2. So the volcano plot highlights every protein above that cutoff line and the upregulated proteins are labeled as red dots and the downregulated proteins are labeled as uh, blue dots. I uh, repeated this uh, workflow seven times with uh, different Lyme disease patient samples and healthy controls each time. And I noticed some proteins are consistently showing up above the cutoff line across uh, different data sets. So for example, uh, thrombose bonding one and the latent transforming growth factor beta binding protein one shows up 100% of the time across all the seven data sets I have. And uh, there, is, uh, there are also proteins like a uh, platelet related proteins such as a uh, platelet factor four, multimorin one or platelet basic protein showing up five or six times out of the seven data sets. In order to study the data uh, in better details, I proceed to combine the data sets I obtained. So I'm able to do that because I use the same normalizer, which is the same tube of uh, serum samples coming from a healthy individual for uh, each data set as a constant control. So when I compare the data, uh, so, so when I compare the data from a different data set, I can uh, use this normalizer as a baseline and make all the samples within each uh, data set become relative to this normalizer. By doing this, I am able to combine different data sets using the same normalizer in a proteome uh, discover to directly compare any samples with each other. And uh, this is a volcano plot I created for uh, the combined data set still with the same cutoff line of a fold change above 1.5 or below negative 1.5 and the significance above two. So uh, from both bonding one always shows up on the top of the graph with a high fold change and significance. And this has been the case for all the seven data sets I have. And obviously it stays true for this combined data set as well as uh, those uh, platelet and uh, TGF beta related proteins clustering together with a similar fold change and uh, significance. In order to uh, better uh, visualize it on a table, I also made a table for those proteins and ranked them based on their Manhattan distance, which is the sum of uh, fold change and significance. So essentially working on the ranking system for the important, uh, for, for the for the importance of the biomarkers uh, from the top to the bottom. All those proteins are going to be a good candidate for, uh, for biomarkers, uh, good, good candidate biomarkers for detecting uh, early Lyme disease. And in order to understand whether the increased amount of those biomarkers makes sense or not, and to kind of um, have a better idea like where they come from and why they are up or down regulated, I started uh, searching for the connections of each biomarker to the Lyme disease, but most of them do not have a direct connection to Lyme disease that can be directly found uh, in the literature. So therefore I made a, a tree diagram trying to put together what happens when there is a Brillia bacteria infection and whether the immune reactions towards the Brillia bacteria has anything to do with the upregulation of those uh, biomarkers I found. I also calculate the, uh, calculated the percentage of Lyme disease patient with each particular biomarker, which is uh, labeled in uh, green. <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, this is going to indicate the percentage of the patient with the upregulated or downregulated of, uh, levels of that biomarker above the cutoff line has set. So using this method, I was roughly able to connect many of the dots together, but still there is a list of the biomarkers I haven't put together in a tree diagram yet. So uh, which are listed here on the side. So it is still in a working progress. From what I put together so far, just like other bacterial infections, Brelia can uh, activate many immune cells, which cause the uh, release of uh, pro-inflammatory molecules to recruit more uh, immune cells to amplify the reaction. And one of the proteins released during the event from the endothelial cells, also uh, it helps activating the platelet. 
Other than that, uh, Brelia is also known to be able to attach to platelet, and their attachment can cause a platelet aggregation and activation, which is linked to a platelet degranulation. The degranulation of an alpha granule and dense granule can result in the release of a multimorine bond, a platelet a basic protein, and a platelet factor 4 that are stored in the platelet granules. And that partially explains the reason for detecting those increased amount of uh, those uh, proteins in many of the patients. And um, thrombose bonding one um, is known to be a biomarker for platelet activation. It is also a major activator for TGF beta one, which is a cytokine that plays a key role in regulating the immune response and the dysregulation of TGF beta are known to be associated with the rheumatoid arthritis in the context of Lyme disease. <clears throat> the recruitment of uh, more immune cells due to the release of uh, pro-inflammatory molecules uh, cause the release of uh, reactive uh, oxygen uh, species, which in turn contribute to uh, tissue damage. And those biomarkers are released uh, as a result of either tissue damage or directly released by the dead cells. And the matrix uh, metalloproteins 9 released by activated uh, macrophage is known to be in, uh, to be is known to be important for Brelia infection. It was uh, suggested by multiple studies that uh, the breaking down of the extracellular matrix helps the propagation of uh, Brelia infection, but the detailed mechanism is still unknown uh, in human. So uh, Brelia infection is known to cause uh, inflammation, and the inflammation. Uh, causes the upregulation of a TGF beta, which is uh, secreted into the extracellular space as a latent TGF complex precursor. So, uh, with the latent transforming growth factor beta binding protein one attached to the TGF beta uh, pro protein non covalently. And once this complex is outside of the cells, matrix metalloproteins 9 released by activated macrophage cleaves this uh, complex to facilitate the generation of a functional TGF beta, as well as a thrombus bonding is known to be activator for a TGF beta. And uh, it is a biomarker found in 93% 93 of the patient in this study above the cutoff uh, line for the change of 1.5. So what's uh, likely happening here is that uh, the upregulation of a TGF beta complex uh, matrix metal of protease 9 uh, from both one in one working together in this case to contribute to the dysregulation of a TGF beta and this is known to be associated with the development of a rheumatoid arthritis in the context of uh, Lyme disease and uh, the three biomarkers on the very bottom are known to be upregulated in uh, Lyme uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients from uh, clinical studies and they are likely involved in the late phase of the Lyme disease instead of the early phase. Mm, however, speculation of uh, how those biomarkers are upregulated during the Brelia infection is not enough because other bacterial infection or inflam in inflammatory uh, disease can also trigger the release of a sim similar pattern of uh, secretive proteins. So what I'm going to do next is the, to continue the to continue the experiment using uh, samples from a patient with uh, EBV infection, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, syphilis, and uh, anti-nuclear antibody, which is an uh, indicator for uh, autoimmune disease to uh, compare with healthy controls and normalizer. So I can eventually combine all the data sets together to determine whether the upregulation of the biomarkers I found so far are unique to Lyme disease or not. It is also uh, worth mentioning that in the very end of the project, it is uh, highly possible that a unique biomarker for Lyme disease cannot be found. So what I'm actually looking for is a bunch of biomarkers connected to Lyme disease. So I will likely use multiple biomarkers that are connected to Lyme disease to form a panel for the detection of uh, early Lyme disease. Another thing to do is to obtain uh, serum conversion samples. The Lyme disease uh, serum, the Lyme disease uh, serum samples we are currently using come from uh, patients that are confirmed to have Lyme disease from early, mid, or late stages of the Lyme disease. However, ideally, we would like to have uh, serum conversion samples, meaning the patient go to a clinic with a suspicion of uh, early Brelia infection, and their blood samples are collected, then uh, initially tested negative. 
and uh, of the Lyme symptom progress, the blood test, uh, the blood samples collected, uh, the blood samples from the patients are collected again and tested positive, confirm uh, Lyme disease. And this uh, type of uh, early Lyme samples would be ideal for this pro for this uh, project. But this uh, kind of sample is very difficult to obtain. And we are trying to get our hands on this type of uh, samples to produce more accurate results. So uh, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you guys for listening. I would also like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Frampton and his uh, collaborators for providing this opportunity for me to work on this project. And also thank to the, thanks to the funding agency for providing the support uh, to this project. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Chang, for your presentation. Um, I'm just looking at the chat box. I don't see any questions right now that have been entered in the chat box, so I will open it up to the audience. If you have a question for Chang, can you please uh, raise your hand uh, icon or on my uh, mic? I see uh, Dr. Vardo has a question. Go ahead, Dr. Vardo. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Hello, Chang. Uh, great talk. Very interesting stuff. Um, it was uh, at the end that you mentioned the composition uh, uh, of the this, the Lyme disease patients. You mentioned that I think some of them were early and some of them were late, but that, that seems like it's quite important, right? Because I, I mean, the the your justification here for this approach is that the classical immunology tests are not catching Lyme disease early enough. And so you're hoping that this proteomics could catch early Lyme disease, but I'm, I'm guessing that a number of your patients, maybe the ones with the strongest metabolomics uh, or proteomics, sorry, proteomics signal are ones that have older infections, right? So can you tell us anything about that? I mean, did you, did you look at the proteomics profile between older Lyme disease patients and, and ones that where the infection is younger? And is there any any uh, differences there? Because if you have to wait four weeks before the, the proteomics signal becomes distinct enough that you can recognize it, then we might as well just stick with the antibody tests, right? Yeah, that is one of the difficulty we're facing right now. So all those uh, serum samples we have right now, they are from a mixture of early, late, or mid Lyme disease. But the thing is, we don't have, we currently don't have enough like information to tell like which sample from early or late or middle. So it's kind of like unlabeled mixture of, just unlabeled mixture of a confirmed uh, serum sample from Lyme disease patients. So that's- So you don't, sorry, just to clarify. So you don't know how old the infections are in the patients. I guess the patients might not, that all they know is they have Lyme disease, but they're not quite sure when they would have gotten it. Yes, exactly. That's very difficult to obtain that kind of information. So that's why we're kind of like desperately trying to obtain those early Lyme disease serum samples. Right. And would there be any um, utility? To, I mean, I know obviously you want to develop this for human patients, but would there be, I mean, if you were to work with a mouse model, then then you could control the infection, right? And and maybe you see some of these same proteins. Would there be any utility to that? That's a good suggestion. We haven't worked like on any other animal models other than just testing the human serum samples, but that's a nice idea. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. Uh, do you expect differences between patients due to illness duration and or patients naive to treatment versus those under anti-biotherapy? anti, -biotherapy? anti -bio uh, Yes, so if the patients are under the therapy already, so I would guess, obviously, since the Borrelia bacteria are suppressed, obviously, they're going to exert a different pattern of uh, secretive proteins. So my guess is yes, but with the current data I have, I cannot tell for sure. Thank you. I see Dr. Kaladi has his hand up. Go ahead, Dr. Kaladi. Thanks. Thanks, Chang. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering about, um, you're looking at proteomic data. Um, I'm co-supervising a student who's looking at transcriptome studies 
in my, and uh, microarray studies. And I wonder if you've thought about trying to link together the uh, the transcript level uh, uh, markers with the uh, proteome markers. Yeah, I actually uh, read a paper online uh, uh, like displaying the transcriptome data, and I like compared that data with mine. Um, I found it strange because like although we have a uh, a few common proteins, just like a thrombose bonding. This is very, uh, like very upregulated in both of the studies. But for the pattern of the rest of the proteins, they are kind of inconsistent to say the least. So I'm not sure why this is happening though. Yeah, I mean, one thing we've noticed with the transcriptome data is it does vary a lot over time. So if you look at different time points, they can, um, the, the markers that come out are quite different. And of course, then there's a, you know um, the 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 time distinction between um, translation and transcription, transcription and translation also is a, another complicating factor. But yeah, though, well, I if I remember correctly, those uh, transcriptome paper they have a uh, thrombose bonding and those are uh, platelet proteins, as well as some of the TGF beta proteins. But for the rest of the secreted protein patterns. They are pretty inconsistent. Rob, can I ask when you said transcriptome, um, are you talking about transcriptome in ticks or mice or humans? What what, what are you looking at? I, I yeah, it's, that, it's humans. So there's several uh, transcriptome and microarray studies now on Lyme disease uh, in humans, and so we we have a student um, who's who's been digging through that data. So not just like what's reported as the main markers in the paper, but actually doing a meta analysis of the um, of the of all the transcripts. Okay, cool. And and this is again, I guess you're you're strat you're going to stratify that based on the putative age of the infection, like whether it's early or chronic, or or and is that again the difficulty of determining the age of the infection? Well, that's all. I mean, we're all limited by what's what's in the what's published, right? That would be uh, ideal. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyway, thanks, Chang. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a qu another question in the chat box. Can you please discuss some of your related findings to muscle atrophy? Oh, muscle atrophy. So, well, we're currently collaborating with the uh, newly formed companies, but uh, I, I signed a like agreement to not review any data. So. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can provide anything about it yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Hi, can you also monitor the changes of highly abundant proteins that were depleted prior to the tests? Maybe they are also informative. Um, sorry, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. Can you also monitor the changes of highly abundant proteins that were depleted prior to the test? Depleted, Maybe they were also informative. Depleted prior to the test. Um, I'm not too sure what that means. If you are talking about the protein depletion column, the protein depletion column do not deplete any of the, those biomarkers. They are just they are just like depleting all those uh, abundant proteins that are like that are abundant in human serum, but none of the biomarkers. Okay, thank you. Uh, if we didn't answer your question, if you could uh, add an additional question in for that uh, question, we'll happy to answer it. Uh, and while, uh, while we're waiting to see if there's an additional follow-up question to that, we have a question. Where are the 11 Lyme disease serum samples sourced from? Are you able to say? Uh, yes, I am able to say. Um, just give me a moment because I need to uh, look at my... Uh, email <laughs> quite all right take your time yeah to 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 tell they are from um Okay, so those samples are uh, from uh, mainly uh, US. And uh, 
other than that, I don't really know too much about it because uh, those samples were here before I uh, took over this project. <laughs> Yeah, this is John Frampton here. I might be able to, to help Chang out with this one a little bit. So, Thanks, so some of the healthy control samples we procured from a uh, biorepository in the U.S. Um, that assured us that the patients had no history of Lyme disease. And the other ones we get from our collaborator at Nova Scotia Health, uh, Todd, Todd Hatchett, um, who has a, a collection of uh, serum samples from confirmed Lyme disease patients. Thank you. So are there any additional questions before we wrap up today's? Oh, here we have a follow-up. So I mean, what if those abundant proteins that were depleted, such as haptoglobin, can be informative of the disease? Haptoglobin. Um, I'm still not quite sure if I understand the question. I'm sorry about it. That's quite all right. Um, okay, we're gonna do one final call. Are there any additional questions from the audience? You can raise your hand icon or enter your question in the chat box. I think, sorry, that the question that Atefe is asking, if I understand it is, you remove the most common proteins, right? To see if, because you wanted to see the less common ones. He's saying, what are those more common proteins that you removed in the beginning? What if there's a signal there? Is it worthwhile looking at those proteins? Because you could still imagine that there could be changes in abundance. Oh, that's what you mean. Oh, yes. So for those uh, proteins we are removing, they are like antibodies and we are not, well, I have a list here, if you can see, they are like mostly like antibodies, they, which our proteins were not too interested in because they are they represent like late line uh, reactions instead of early ones and for those other proteins um for those proteins here yeah to be quite honest i haven't looked at whether they are going to have an effect on the early Lyme disease or not yet so far but he's suggesting that maybe you should look at those maybe you'll see an interesting pattern Yes, that is true. That's a very nice suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Verdo, for helping us out with that uh, question. Uh, again, one last time, any additional questions for Chang before we wrap up today's presentation? Check the chat, make sure. Oh, I don't see any more questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to personally thank Chang for taking this opportunity, as well as Dr. Uh, John Frampton, his lab, for presenting at uh, today's uh, Lyme disease uh, awareness event and tick-borne diseases. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Hopefully you can see it. Perfect. Uh, we are continuing our series of presentations tomorrow. We have Karen Orth who will be presenting on neck instability and Lyme disease, the potential connections. So hopefully you can tune in tomorrow at 12 o'clock uh, noon Eastern time. Also reminder, um, if you want to take part in our contest, um, our challenge, wear green, take a photo and share it with the help of spread awareness of Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You can also send in photos of your creative artwork that express Lyme disease and tick-borne disease awareness month. They will be entered in the draw. All photos submitted will be entered in a draw of one of, 20, one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. Um, and the live draw will occur on our last day of presentations at one o'clock. You can send your photos to Clydern at gmail.com along with your name and email. And finally, just to let you know, uh, TickNet Canada. So we are evolving Canadian Lyme disease research network into involve also other tick-borne diseases. So we're forming TickNet Canada, and we'll be holding our first scientific symposium in person in Toronto, October 24th to 25th. We're hoping to get registration and abstract submission uh, coming in the next few weeks. So just wanted to let you know. And if we have the information before the end of the month, we will be sharing it uh, at these presentations as well, sending out an email to anybody who's part of our distribution list. So again, thank you for uh, participating and attending our virtual presentation. Thank you to Chang and Dr. Frampton's lab for uh, presenting today and take care. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you at the presentations later this week. Take care, everybody. See you. Thank you.